as you'd expect. The sect leader doesn't hesitate to receive his rewards, and as soon as he makes his request, the system begins releasing his winds to him. The message appears in front of him, and a whirlwind starts to blow to confirm this release. Lukeo sees the magical mini tornado, and admits that he finds the special effects too crass, just like he did the first time he saw it. Overall, it's kind of weird to him, and after that, he receives his well-deserved 20,000 experience points, feeling more relaxed about how normal it is. Unfortunately, the special effects start again when the system starts assessing the mission. The whirlwind blows again, and he starts to wonder if it doesn't even cost any money, considering how showy it is. A message appears before him, confirming that the system is about to begin assessing his mission progress, but then the next thing he sees are question marks, which makes him very confused. The annoying symbols quickly disappear, so our boy is relieved, and he confirms that the system is just trying to act dramatic like usual. He wonders why it can't just present his score directly, and while he's still thinking about this, his attention is drawn to the huge number 2 that is on display. Lukeo's first reaction is utter disbelief, because there's no way he's accepting that score. However, the system shows how dramatic it can be by slowly pushing the number up to 82, making the sect leader calm down because it's more acceptable. With one box left to go, our boy eagerly awaits what the final score will be, but he's disappointed when a zero shows up in front, confirming that his final score is 82. A message from the system appears, revealing that the sect leader has been rewarded with 82 reputation points with the conclusion of his mission assessment. Seeing this score, he wonders how he can make it up to 100, so for some reason, he feels that he might need to beat up the elders aside from beating up the younger ones to achieve this. At this point, he begins to regret letting those two shitty elders go scot-free. While he's pondering on all of this, his reputation points continue to grow until they exceed the 1000 mark threshold. When he sees this, he realizes that the points are now enough for his sect to exceed the 8th rank sect. So, he quickly taps on the message, which reveals another page containing the requirements to upgrade to 8th ranked sects. Out of the three criteria, his sect still needs three members of the 2nd rank and above. He also needs at least 100 disciples at least for this upgrade, and unfortunately, most sect has only 8. Seeing this, he admits that it should be easier to get two more members to second rank or above. As for the 100 disciple requirement, our boy already knows that it's going to be very difficult. Besides, he's gained enough experience points for himself, so it wouldn't be such a bad idea to help his members level up in rank. With this in mind, Lukeo decides that it's time for him to level up two ranks. In an instant, the hero jumps from level 17 to 19, achieving his first rank great completion in the process. Outside, while Sayo is cultivating, Dong Li senses that her brother has broken through again, going up two levels this time around. At the same time, the guest with big balloons on her chest senses it, and realizes that it's the first rank completion. She convinces herself that Lukeo hasn't done something so difficult, recalling how she and Yu Yue have done the same before. But what really intrigues her is the fact that the hero was really just first rank when they were in the Shu Yue sect. Nan Wai also realizes that the young lord used the sword intent at such a low rank, so she's completely baffled by it. She doesn't even understand how he did it, because even her own father told her that one shouldn't even try using sword intent if they're not at least third rank. Even Yu Yue, a once in a thousand year genius swordsman, couldn't use sword intent until he was at third rank. With the shocking revelation, Nan Wai wonders if she should go there and capture him for more investigation. Although it's tempting, she ultimately decides to calm down since she's the daughter of the sword sovereign. At this point, she's practically taking in deep breaths to compose herself because of the anxiety. She wants to go and meet him badly because she's apparently obsessed with swordsmanship, but still, she decides that it's better to see him when he's done digesting and absorbing after his breakthrough. It turns out that the busty chick's obsession started long before now, and in a flashback, we see how she tied Yu Yue up, because she found out he has the once in a thousand year peerless sword body. Back then, she hovered over him like a psycho creep, claiming that she wanted to investigate him thoroughly, and all that the poor swordsman could do was scream for help. Even though no one knows exactly what happened that night, one thing that's certain is that Yu Yue kept calling for his senior brother, even after he fell unconscious. As for the Mo sect leader, he's busy stretching himself out, oblivious to Nan Wai's crazy plans for him. His little yoga session is interrupted when he receives another mission from the system. He's filled with excitement when he sees that there's another mission to help him level up even more, and since the orange mission gave him a spiritual awakening voucher the last time, he doesn't even think twice before choosing it again. After this, a message appears confirming that he's selected the mission with difficulty of Orange, and as he reads the mission details, he admits that there's a pleasant coincidence. With a confident grin on his face, he claims that the mission is like pushing oneself into hell even when there's no door. Lukeo probably gets a feeling of deja vu when he sees that his new leveling mission is to kill another demon cultivator. But this time, it's one from a mysterious organization, so he starts to get a feeling that the coming year won't be peaceful. 
Just then, a magical timer appears, counting down from 48 hours, which pleases the sect leader a lot, because he knows that the hunting begins now. The system provides a screen that pinpoints the location of the target, and when Lukeo sees this, he feels that the demon cultivator should appreciate the next few hours, because they'd be the last moments of its life. The next morning, we see our boy already sitting on a huge rock, and with the way glowing waves of water surround him, you can immediately tell that he's in the middle of an intense cultivation session. Apparently, cultivating every day is one of the sect leader's habits. Small matters won't make him change his habits, and since he considers the demon cultivator a very small issue, it's no wonder why he's still up there. He eventually opens his eyes and realizes that it's already morning. At the same time, Nanwai prepares to make her move, commenting that the sect leader's cultivating skill is quite impressive. It appears she's already trying to capture him, so she's smiling awkwardly and invading his personal space. After she's done giggling like a weirdo, Lukeo just informs her that it's very rude to interrupt people when they're cultivating in silence. He knows that she's trying to distract him and break down his defenses with her big jugs. So, he looks away like the Sigma that he is, deciding that he won't let women get into his head with their temptations. Seeing that he's not in a playful mood, Nanwai instantly apologizes, claiming that she knows her faults, while leaning even closer to him this time. Of course, this pisses off the sect leader, since he's a man with 10 out of 10 charm. He decides that he needs to avoid her, especially since she's obsessed with swords. With this in mind, he immediately turns away from her, reminding himself that a big brother and his younger disciples shouldn't interact too much, to avoid rumors from growing. After making up his mind, he turns back to her, and tells her that he has something to deal with outside the mountains. He throws his flying item out so it grows bigger, and urges Nanwai to move freely around the Mo sect while he's away. Seeing that he's trying to evade her, she quickly tells him to wait up, and claims that she has something to ask him. Our boy has already mounted his flying leaf boat at this point, but he just tells her to go on with her question, so she reveals what her father once told her about no one being able to use sword intent before reaching third rank. So, she asks him why he was able to do this before rank 3, and upon hearing this question, Lukeo glances back at her, before telling her that he was able to do it, because the sword sovereign is wrong. Our boy makes this insanely bold statement, zooming off on his flying item, leaving Nanwai stunned at his words. She probably feels that her ears are playing tricks with her because everyone knows that the Sword Sovereign is the leader of swordsmanship and the brightest ray of light in all of King Zhuo. Anyone who hears what Liu Keo just said would immediately conclude that he's lost his mind, but Nanwai suddenly thinks back to something else her father told her. The Sword Sovereign once admitted that he doesn't define swordsmanship of the present generation even though he's the leader of it, and this makes Nanwai feel that her old man would really like Liu Keo if they had a chance to meet. Meanwhile, the sect leader soars on his flying leaf both, feeling very eager to find out what reward he would get after completing the orange-leveled mission. Just thinking about it makes his blood boil with excitement even though he hasn't even found the target of the mission yet. Bro is so confident that he's going to win, that he calls the demon cultivator his cute monster, and prays for it to clean its neck for decapitation. However, we quickly confirm that there's nothing cute about this monster, because it's one of those high-ranked demon cultivators that have other beasts following them. This demon cultivator's beasts also have a strong bloodline, as well as the ability to grow even stronger by consuming others. Overall, this opponent is poised as one that can't be defeated alone. However, our boy is different, because he's literally just a walking cheat. The scene shifts to a place called Jin New Village. There, we see a little girl running around, playing with a stick while her mother yells for her to slow down so she doesn't trip. Safe to say she completely ignores her mum, because she just keeps running and laughing. The village has a small river next to it, and the water is considered to be very clear. We get a nice view of the fine body of water, and just then, a purple-haired lady with animal print clothing emerges from it. Her eyes glimmer with a murderous look, and she licks her lips as she stares at the village, claiming that she's found another one. Another human village for her and the massive beasts behind her to devour. Apparently, she's the demon cultivator our boy is meant to face, and it's safe to say that she and her beasts are very hungry for some human flesh. As such, she sends her terrifying pets to go ahead and eat up the fresh flesh and blood of the unsuspecting villagers. She particularly mentions that the kid looks very tasty and admits that it made her drool already. Without wasting any second, the huge water monsters swim to the banks where they instantly leap out of the water to eat the people. The villagers scramble away to safety when they see the giant beasts on their shores. But while the older people with longer legs run as fast again, the kid just looks up at the beast, terrified and helpless. One of the monsters targets the girl and makes its move to attack, but the girl's mother quickly gets in the way to save her. She screams for the creature not to hurt her child, and just when it looks like they might both be killed, a huge wave of water pushes the beast back into the river. The two sea monsters screech and roar at the person who just stole their meal, but the tall wave just keeps growing bigger to block them from getting into the village. 
The mother and daughter see the huge wall of water protecting them and are completely confused until they see the person controlling it. Yep, it's none other than our boy, Lukeo, who's eager to teach the beasts a lesson. The sect leader glances at the woman and tells her to back off, so she immediately runs away with her child, thanking the mysterious cultivator for saving them. After the villagers are safe, Lukeo focuses his attention on the level 21 giant snake and the level 20 giant spider that are currently confronting him. Looking up at the monster, he admits that it's not bad, and as they try to charge at him, their master calls them off. The demon cultivator finally joins the party, claiming that she would like to see the person who had the balls to get in the way of their meal. She sees Lukeo standing confidently, looking so majestic with glowing waves of water floating all around him, and this leaves her stunned. The demon cultivator is instantly infatuated with our boy after seeing how handsome he is, and then she makes a very dark joke, claiming that he looks very tasty. The young lord just smiles smugly when he hears this, and entertains the conversation, so he asks her in what way she would like to eat him. At this point, the demon cultivator reveals that she wants to rip him apart, and a very sinister look appears on her face. She claims that she wants to eat him with dipping sauce after ripping him to shreds. But Lukeo just activates his power in response, informing her that her fantasy isn't the kind of eating he looks forward to. An explosion erupts, and the next thing we see is the sect leader charging at her, revealing that he expected a much tamer and nicer way of eating from her. But when she sees that he's coming to attack, she prepares herself for the fight. This demon cultivator suddenly starts absorbing the energy all around, laughing as she tells him that fighting her is the same as courting death. While the demon cultivator is still sucking all the energy around, our boy casually closes her mouth with water. She's extremely shocked by this, but Lukeo reveals that he used his water ability to do it. This is when she realizes that he has the power of heaven and earth, so as expected, she's horrified by it. Before she can even do anything else, he just attacks her with another round of his power, telling her goodbye before she's completely destroyed. Seeing this, one of her giant pets dives in to save her, but before it can get to the young lord, he jumps away to evade the attack. Even though he manages to make the giant snake crash its head into a rock, the giant spider is also waiting right behind him to land a surprise attack. The villagers who are watching the whole thing start yelling out to the handsome hero, telling him to be careful with the monsters. However, our boy remains unbothered by the situation, and tells them to rest assured that he's very strong. He just stays on the floor, casually waiting for the giant spider to attack, and when it gets close enough, he uses his dark fog to slam it in the face. Seeing this heroic display from him, the little girl from earlier joins the long list of Lukeo's admirers and concludes that he must be a big cultivator with such good looks. After landing that devastating blow, the sect leader starts to feel that his level is too low, because just that hit drained one out of five of his total man's bar. As such, he decides that he has to end the fight quickly, and that's about the same time that his opponent returns with her giant snake for another round. She's furious that a beginner's rank dares to challenge her so she orders her pets to rip him apart. The snake and the spider charge at our boy at the same time, but it turns out that this is what he wanted from the start. He urges them to hurry up, and then starts to conjure a thick white mist all around him. Seeing this, the demon cultivator yells at her beasts to hurry up, because she thinks that the young lord is trying to hide from them. Unfortunately for her, she has no idea how wrong she is, because Lukeo certainly isn't planning on hiding from anybody. He knows that true men don't always back down from a fight, so he prepares his next attack by activating a move called Water Pressure. This skill is used to increase the pressure of the water vapor before pressing it down on the enemies. The beasts are only a few meters from him when he activates another move called Splash Ink. The sect leader completely obliterates the two huge monsters with this skill and then informs the demon cultivator that she's the last one left. Feeling confident, he taunts her, asking how she would like to eat him now, so she replies with rage, claiming that she wants to rip him apart while he's still conscious and then force him to watch her eat his flesh bit by bit. The hero is amused when he hears this and just teases her for being cruel by telling her that she reminds him of some foreign friends that eat bullfrogs the same way. Seeing him distracted for a second, she uses the opportunity to attack him with a poison mist. However, it doesn't harm him. He already showed her that his power is that of heaven and earth, but she still decided to attack with a poison mist made of water, so this just makes him wonder if her brain is working at all. The demon cultivator is immediately horrified when she realizes her mistake, and before she can even think of her next move, Lukeo uses his water power to blast her back to wherever she came from. As a result of this blast, her body begins to slowly decay, and it appears that she'll be dead any moment. However, she quickly conjures a huge barrier to protect herself from the hero's power before the rest of her body is destroyed. She stays inside the barrier to catch her breath, so when our boy sees this, he's surprised that she still isn't dead. From inside the barrier, the demon cultivator begs him to spare her life, and even offers him her body, claiming that it's great. However, Lukeo just looks at her in disappointment. He admits that he used to be addicted to the few instances of pleasure, and he also points out that her body is truly a tempting and sinful one. 
Regardless, he informs her that women only know the speed at which he draws his sword, claiming that the dead soul she ate want her to die sooner. While he's saying this, the demon spider continues to roll on the ground even though it's on its last breath. The unsuspecting little girl begins to celebrate, thinking that the hero has won. But that's when the beast suddenly comes back to life and attacks. Thankfully, the girl manages to get to Lukeo first, so when she calls out to him, he uses his black fog to blast it away. Unfortunately, he still got injured by the beast, so he pulls out the sharp claw he was stabbed with. The little girl starts crying and blames herself for his wound, but he immediately comforts her by distracting her with hundreds of bubbles floating around her. While she's playing around, Lukeo disappears from the scene, and after he leaves, all the villagers bow to the floor and thank the mysterious cultivator who saved them. As our boy leaves the village for good, one of the residents asks for his name. So as the demon cultivator and her beasts burn up in the small settlement, they realize that he is Lukeo of the Mosect. Sometime later, we see the young lord flying home on his leaf boat. While taking a pill for his injury, he scrutinizes the demon cultivator's dress, claiming that the material can't be used even though the design isn't too bad. He feels that beast clothes are of low quality, and since it's of a yellow-grade material, he decides that selling it will be the best choice. Besides, the dress is too revealing, and he fears that even small movements in it will cause unintentional exposure. Overall, he concludes that it's truly an immoral piece of clothing. Well, it's a demon's dress so it's kind of expected. He looks back down to the village he just saved, and sees that the people are still thanking him. It's quite baffling to him the way the world of Tiangshuan works. Because even though cultivators can't become immortal and are just a little stronger than common people, the ordinary men still believe that the sword cultivators will always protect them. He admits that it kind of makes sense though, because what's the point of wielding a sword if one can't protect the weak? As the people wave goodbye finally, Lukeo takes out the dead demon cultivator's storage bracelet to check what's inside. At first, he's excited, but when he opens it and sees only seven spiritual stones, he's instantly disappointed that she's even poorer than him. But then, suddenly, his hopes shoot up again when he feels something bigger inside. Unfortunately, they're quickly dashed again when he discovers that it's just a human skull with several missing teeth. The hero just tells it to rest in peace, assuring it that he's exacted revenge on the owner's behalf. The next thing he finds inside is a pair of purple moon badges, which makes him realize that she was really a member of the organization. At least, killing her was a waste, and even though she was really poor, the best item she owned was one that she wore on herself. Our boy moves on from that, and submits the mission results, hoping to get something nice from the system this time around. Immediately, a message pops up, informing him that the rewards will be through a roulette, and it wishes him luck. It also informs him that the rewards are divided into four ranks, from A, which is the best, to D, which is the worst. The massive roulette appears, and at first glance, you can tell that the system doesn't want him to win anything good. The space on the roulette for high rank rewards is really tiny, while the lowest rank practically covers 60% of the space. Lukeo is furious when he sees this, and claims that it's not fair, but the system just responds that it's true. He demands to know where it even learned such a cruel method. But when he doesn't get a response, he decides to try it out, feeling that his luck is enough to get him the high-ranked rewards. Without any further hesitation, he activates the roulette. And when it's time for it to stop spinning, his anxiety shoots out of the roof. It looks like it's about to land on A, but then it moves to the next column which is C, so the hero has no choice but to swear in frustration. Suddenly, he sees that it doesn't stop there, and while he's screaming at the system, it throws out a reward to him. Lukeo opens it and is shocked to see that it's a special grade copying voucher. It's practically a cheat-level treasure that can copy any item in the world, including a cheat item for the game. It's at this point that he remembers he has one of the four main characters' cheat items back at home. It's owned by the four main characters in Tiangshuan, and Yu Yue has one too. So, Lukeo feels that there is a huge secret behind it, since it comes from the world's extremely big sect in ancient times, Tian Yi Dao. With this in mind, the hero concludes that the Chosen One must have one of the main characters' cheat items too, so he decides that he'll ask her to let him touch it. This is common knowledge in the game because everyone knows that there are five members in the Four Heavenly Kings. But who are these kings, and what will be the effects of his latest reward? Also, now that we know the big balloon lady is already obsessed with our hero's talents, how will she try and get close to him? Stay tuned to find out in the next episode. Until next time.